Section 3. Cultural Challenge 3. Accept Life's Greatest Challenges. Spiritual Breakthrough. Moment by moment, accept life's greatest challenges, or crosses, using the primary values to let the Spirit and power of God keep you on track to God, and so God might evangelize through you. Use a wallet-sized card to stay on the path to God moment by moment. If you never leave God in the moment, you will never leave your path to God. We will now turn to a video presentation in the moment. Jeff Lieto, founder of Loquate, a charity for peace, will share two real-life stories of using primary values in the moment to stay on track to come to God. In the moment is so important, for if ever we leave God, it will be in the moment. By carrying our cross and using the primary values, we can stay on track to God. We will now view the video. For context, I, we talked about our feelings and... The, the point of um, the three primary values are that if an experience goes against one or more of those primary values, we will feel bad, even if other values are present. And it's a way of understanding why we feel the way that we do. So on the, on the front of the page, it shows the three primary values. You can <coughs> fold this card in half, and it becomes a wallet-sized card. You can keep it in your wallet. And um, so now here's the example that I want to share with you. This, this happened to me about uh, two weeks ago. I'm a financial planner, and we had to move money from our, for our clients from one area to another. And that was when oil had collapsed and the market was going down really big time. And when you delve into it and you understand, well, what's the problem here? We found that oil was in, oil-related securities were in many of the broad holdings that we had. Even the uh, U.S. Total Market Index Fund had 7% of its holdings in oil-related securities, and those were tanking. Yep. So um, we had to make a decision. Are we going to, is this a big enough thing that we're going to move that money? And we made the decision that we were going to move it. And uh, then we had to find the replacements. Now all of this happens very fast. And if you actually end up, you've got to get the okays from the clients and everything to make the changes. And after you've done that, then you actually have to execute them. And that's kind of get to where it gets hairy because you got a lot of money and you're executing the trades. And you could make a mistake. So, um, it had already taken me longer when, than you wanted to, you knew where you wanted to go, but you didn't have all your information down, so you couldn't actually move there. So, we're at that point in time. So, I'm starting to uh, make the changes, and I'm tempted inside, inside myself. There's a, a kind of like a nagging bad feeling in the back of my head, okay? It, it is Satan in tempting me that if I don't go fast, my clients are going to leave me. Well, this is my livelihood. I don't want, that's a serious thing. So I took time out. And I thought to myself, um, I thought to myself, okay, let's say my clients leave me because of this. I accept that, if that is your will for me. And I said, I'm doing everything I can for my clients all the time. That's what, that's what I do. So if that's not enough, then I'll just have to accept that. And furthermore, God has been good to me in my life. He's given me enough to do the things that we've needed to do to raise our family. He's not going to turn his back on me. And so, with that understanding and acceptance of what I call my cross, um, I went back to work. Now this process only took me, you know, maybe a minute or so to reflect on it. And the opposite of that, you see, if I were to go fast 
and were to make a mistake on my job, that would be really bad. And the tempter, he gives us lies to uh, keep us from going down the path. So now notice when that happened. That happened in a moment, okay? We have seen the Bible history of what happened to God's chosen people. They would veer off the course. We're all tempted to veer off the course. So what keeps you on the course? It's in the moment by moment that you decide to either stay on course or not. Now how does Satan work? He's very, he, he slips us, he gives us a little slip to, you know, change a little teeny bit, just a little teeny bit, and then you do that, and then, then just a little bit more, right? And then a little bit more, and the Satan is real, and Satan is wrapped in chains by God that we might better know ourselves. That the decisions, our free will that we have, can, at each step of the way, we know, oh, this would be worse if I did that. And that's kind of like, well, I've got to get a control of myself here. I've got to get under my, i got to get to my senses here. So notice, notice that whole process. It's a moment-by-moment -moment thing, okay? So what, isn't the kind of the question, why did the Israelites veer off course like that so much? Weren't they, when you look at uh, salvation history, don't you wonder kind of like, wow, when are they going to get it, you know? Does this keep after repeating itself? And what about us? So the way that we can stay on the track is in the moment by moment. That's why it's important to take a check of your own feelings, of how you're feeling about something, and then to uh, make the decision that there's some things you can control, those things you can change yourself. So if it's totally dependent upon yourself, you can change those things. But on the middle, of the, the back of the card, it's those things that you can't change yourself. Can I keep my clients from leaving me? I can't. You know, ultimately, it's their decision. And so you separate out. This helps you to separate out, know what you can control and what you can't control. And if you can't control it, and it can hurt you real bad, then what are you going to do? Are you going to choose God? Are you going to choose his will for you? Or are you going to be misled a bit? So the, the point is that in that moment, you can accept your cross, you pray, you make a decision, you have to make a decision. You know, if that is your will for me, you think of the worst that can happen to me. If that is your will for me, even that, then I accept it. Now, it doesn't mean that you're caving in or anything. It just means that you realize you, it's, it, it's, we're not in control. And so isn't that really what, what, what evolves into sin? If you don't hear God in your heart, if you don't do what he wants you to, to be doing? So isn't this a way to, moment by moment, to go through that little process again? So... Um, you think of the worst that can happen to you. You consciously make the decision. If that is your will for me, I accept even that. And then you pray. Because you can't, you can't accept these things on your own. I can't accept it on my own. My livelihood is important to me. I don't want my livelihood to go. So I, that, that's when I pray. And when I pray, I get a consolation. I get joy and peace. Okay. Now, I might have to say this prayer, depending on how bad it was. I had one situation, where not, not related to work, but related to, to, to other matters, where these things kept coming up all the time. I, in, in one day's time, I might have to do it 20 times. You know, every time it comes up, every time I do it. Okay? And that, this, this, really, this really works. So in my second example about, um, I don't know, it must be 10 years ago now, um, I had a client, I got a client, and the person had two insurance policies. And in studying his uh, situation, the uh, premiums that he had paid in 
equaled the death benefit on the policy. So, and he had no cash value in the policy. He was 76 years old. He had it for a long time. So that meant that if he were to die right then, the uh, insurance company would pay him the face value of the policy, give him his money back. But since they had use of the money for all those years, they'd be far ahead. Not only that, but from age 76 to age 100, he would have to pay four to five times more than the policy value in premiums, more than the death benefit in premiums. The insurance company was hoping that when he discovered that, that he would just let the policy lapse and walk away. In which case, the insurance company would have what? All, All the money. All the money. No okay. So this was obviously unfair. So I contacted the insurance company. I told them the problem and they turned a deaf ear on me. Then I contacted the uh, insurance commissioner for the state of Illinois, and after much correspondence and everything, they turned a deaf ear on me. Furthermore, this person had a medical condition, so they needed to have the policy. So I said to the person, I will stay with you. I will not charge you anything for the work that I am doing. And furthermore, I am going to give, from this point forward, I'm going to give all of my commissions that I receive on insurance to charity as my act of non-cooperation, non-violence against the deceptive practice in the insurance industry. Now at this point in time, you have to understand, I had seen so many deceptive practices that I had just had enough. The person, uh, I met him in his uh, hospital room, and we were talking, and he said to me, he said, Jeff, if I die, we'll stick it to him with this ins these insurance policies. And for him to say that was very uncharacteristic. We both just laughed. He's a, he's a very faithful person. But he was just seriously seeing what, what his situation was. And then... Um, he had complications, and within two weeks, he did pass away. Uh, the providence, providence of this, this, this idea of putting your trust in God. Okay, here was a man who put his trust in God. Here was me putting my trust in God. We did all that we could do. And um, it did work out in this case for this person. So, I mean, isn't that what we are supposed to be doing in our work? Pope Benedict XVI said in an encyclical, caritas and veritate, which means charity and truth. He said that each one of us are called to do a job that only we can do. Whatever your job is, that's your job. That's your job. And truth, in that context, means your work. And not only that, but it means the truth of coming to God and the truth of, of living your, your beliefs. In the, in the marketplace. So sometimes it's hard, so sometimes we get some of those black circles in there, but still we got to keep doing the same thing. And so he said that he believed that the answer to globalization, the collapse of, near collapse of the world economy in 2008, was each person individually doing what God is calling them to do from inside of their heart. Now, that is an answer, one person at a time, isn't it? Doesn't it get back to the moment-by-moment moment thing? And so what are we promised? We're promised peace and joy. Okay, so those are always the choices. And Christ, who died on the cross, what an example is that for us? So, you know, are we willing to take our cross, pick up our cross, he said, he told us, he admonished us, you know, you have to pick up your cross. If you're going to follow me, you have to pick up your cross. And so isn't that the meaning of the whole thing? So you have right here a little distillation which you can keep in your pocket and refer to moment by moment. Thank you.
After we make a conscious decision to throw our lot in with Jesus, then we will be set tempted to set aside God's call for us by temptations of the world's plan for us. We must accept our cross, John chapter 18, verse 11. The tool to accept our cross is to think of the worst that can happen to us and accept even that if that is God's will for us. If we pray for our acceptance of our cross again and again, as often as we are tempted to reject our cross, then by grace our cross will become light. We will know we have succeeded by the joy we experience. We can try this and experience joy. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 verses 1 to 5. When I came to you, brothers, proclaiming the mystery of God, I did not come with sublimity of words or of vision or of wisdom, for I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I came to you in weakness and fear and much trembling, and my message and my proclamation were not with persuasive words of wisdom, but with a demonstration of spirit and power, so that your faith might rest not on human wisdom, but on the power of God. St. John Paul II in his encyclical Fides et Ratio in number 23 said, Reason cannot eliminate the mystery of love which the cross represents while the cross can give to reason the ultimate answer which it seeks. The preaching of Christ crucified and risen is the reef upon which the link between faith and philosophy can break up, but it is also the reef beyond which the two can set forth upon the boundless ocean of truth. Here we see not only the border between reason and faith, but also the space where the two may meet. The wisdom of the cross, therefore, breaks free of all cultural limitations which seek to contain it and insists upon an openness to the universality of the truth with it, which it bears. What a challenge this is to our reason, and how great the gain for reason if it yields to this wisdom. Of itself, philosophy is able to recognize the human being's ceaselessly self-transcendent orientation towards the truth. And with the assistance of faith, it is capable of accepting the foolishness of the cross as the authentic critique of those who delude themselves that they possess the truth, when in fact they run it aground on the shoals of a system of their own devising. The Holy Spirit is the principal agent of the new evangelization. Tertio Millennio ad Benito, Numbers 18 and 45. By accepting our cross, we become holier. The cross strips us clean of attachments to things of this world that keep us from loving more fully. And as Keith Strom, New Evangelization Director, Archdiocese of Chicago, said in a blog on 5.20.13, In other words, as we grow in holiness, we become freer to utilize the charisms we have received for the sake of the world. The cross is efficacious when offered up for the poor souls in purgatory, for ourselves, for our loved ones, and for the world, because Christ suffered first on the cross. It is in following Christ's example that St. Paul chose more than anything else, and so St. Paul says about suffering in Romans chapter 8, verse 37, No, in all these things we conquer overwhelmingly through him who loved us using the primary values to stay in the path to God moment by moment. The primary values help us to understand our feelings. We already discussed one primary value, which is operating in an area of meaningful expansion for yourself. Another primary value is doing that which is truly in the best interests of others. This primary value is the Franciscan definition of love. We are to love all before us. Another primary value is attaining a goal or other end not necessarily preconceived as a goal, but which becomes a goal once experienced. Hypothesis. There are natural law primary values behind our feelings toward which every person of every religion and every person ever born is drawn. Each of these primary values is de discreet and prepotent over our feelings of good and bad. Dignity comes from primary values. 
Can you find scripture that supports dignity for all? First primary value, love. Doing that which is truly in the best interests of others. The scripture, do to others as you would have them do to you. Luke chapter 6 verse 31. This is my commandment, love one another as I love you. John chapter 15 verse 12. You shall love your neighbor as yourself, Leviticus, chapter 19, verse 18. Hatred stirs up disputes, but love, love covers all offenses, Proverbs, chapter 10, verse 12. Second primary value that dignity comes from, work. Attaining a goal or other end not necessarily preconceived as a goal, but which becomes a goal once experienced. The scripture supporting work. My father is at work until now, so I am at work. John chapter 5 verse 17. Not that I say this because of need, for I have learned in whatever situation I find myself to be self-sufficient. Philippians chapter 4 verse 11. The Lord God then took the man and settled him in the Garden of Eden to cultivate and care for it. Genesis chapter 2 verse 15. Prosper the work of our hands. Psalm 90 chapter 7, verse 17. The third primary value that leads to dignity, meaningful expansion. Operating in an area of meaningful expansion for yourself. Scripture quote on meaningful expansion. Whatever you do, do from the heart as for the Lord and not for others. Colossians chapter 3, verse 23. I then, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to live in a manner worthy of the call you have received, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another through love, striving to preserve the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 to 3. For the vision is a witness for the appointed time, a testimony to the end will not disappoint. If it delays, wait for it. It will surely come. It will not be late. Habakkuk chapter 2 verse 3. For I know well the plans I have in mind for you, oracle of the Lord, plans for your welfare and not for woe, so as to give you a future of hope. Jeremiah chapter 29 verse 11. The rule if one or more of the values is present and the experience does not go against any of the other values, you will feel good. If the experience goes against one or more of the values, you will feel bad, even if other values are present. Dignity means feeling good about ourself and about others. Seeming exception. A seeming exception to the primary values is a dual experience, for example, in a religious experience. On the one hand, a person could feel bad because an experience went, went against a primary value. But on the other hand, the person had joy in a dual experience of choosing to live according to one's beliefs in spite of not feeling good. Such a person experienced joy at living according to their beliefs and in the midst of suffering felt good about living according to one's beliefs and felt bad about the harshness of an environment that went against one or more of the primary values. So such a person would need to know how to interpret each of two experiences using a specific point in time to clarify use of the primary values. That is why the wallet size card is so useful. It teaches us how to accept our cross and do the will of God. It teaches us how to never get off the path to God. Our cross will strip us clean of attachments to things of the world that keep us from loving God or others.